Uh, my name is uh, Sonja Schweizenberger. I am from uh, Sweden and happy to host this panel that will be about making LARPs uh, in uh, already known universes uh, versus creating them on your own. And I have a lovely panel which is experienced uh, in both of these chambers, or hopefully the chambers in these ways. Um, Erik Fatman, welcome. Thank you. Also, we'll have to do this, this is why I'm sitting in the middle. Uh, you created Marcello's basement uh, after, or in the universe of Kaiser's Orchestra. When was this? Uh, this was five years ago, so 2012, 11. Yeah. We'll come back to that. Uh, Mia Hegström, you worked with Coven uh, from American Horror Story 3. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's about it. <laughs> And Martin Eriksson, uh, you both both work with uh, World of Darkness, and you create LARPs in that universe, uh, but also did uh, Hamlet a couple of years ago, and like now again, right? You make so many Hamlet LARPs. Uh, eight times, uh, games based off the work of the poet. Um, Hamlet, so running ninth and tenth time. Uh, I, mean, I think the first time was ninety-eight. With we had an inflatable. We were all babies. Yes. I have also done a, done a ton of custom worlds, of course, for an art, like all others. Thank you. And Anna Karin Linde, you made a uh, alarm called Tekamon, right? Yeah, you have to do that. Yeah, know. it was a small art called Tekamerone that is in the world of The Handmaiden's Tale by Margaret Atwood, but I'm also mostly working with this IP, the real world, as an inspiration, and also done my own worlds, of course. But that's the only one that is like an existing IP. Thanks. I thought I hadn't done that, but then I remembered I actually made a production back in 1999 that was called Robin Hood and Her Merry Lesbians. <laughs> so I have something to say about this. All right, uh, first of all, I'd like to know uh, really quickly, like, what do you prefer, creating your own universe or using something that we already know something about? Anna Karin, start. Uh, I'm going to be boring and say it totally depends on what you want to do and what you want, aim for to, to tell. To have a, a known world, is, it's easy because you get a, an easy hook for the, 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 the players. They will know exactly what to expect and how to be in that world, so it's easier for persons that maybe haven't LARPed that much before, if they know the, the IP, but everybody knows Harry Potter, so it's very easy to, to go into it, but if you create your own world, you have more freedom of what you want to tell and how you want to tell it, so of course it depends. I, I, I've had fundamentalist answers to both, and I've changed my mind. As I grow older, and I'm not, I, I don't have the need to share my fan fiction through LARP letters and force people to read them uh, so much anymore. Uh, but so yeah, I, I started out being completely. You need to build the world to fit the game, otherwise you're doing it wrong. Now I kind of think that why spend all that time on creating the world where you can create the specific instance, like the specific event, the specific LARP, and put all your energy into that, and save people tons of bad fantasy world writing. Sorry. <laughs> um, the LARP that I did come in was, of course, an adaptation of an art already existing world, and I did actually find when I was working on that that I realized in that moment that I enjoy this way more than when I wrote and you create your own works. Um, so I'm going to go with that one. So far. So far. <laughs> I mean, like, I could give a lot of nuanced and complex answers to that, that question, but that would be rather boring. So I'm going to go, come straight out and say that if you are setting your LARP in, in reference or setting that is not in your control, or somehow in the control of your community, then you're doing evil. <laughs> Shots fired! Yeah. This is a promising start. <laughs> Alright, so the two of you then that felt that there are benefits to placing a story or a LARP in the universe, so a movie, a book, or like a, a band even. Uh, what are like the uh, the best benefits of it? You were starting a little bit, what would you say? Uh, 
Uh, well, first of all, obviously, it's the <coughs> recognition of the material uh, and an easy reference source, telling somebody, read this book, watch this film. Um, that's a very easy way of explaining where we're going to kind of be in the fiction. Um, so, yes, <laughs> I think that would be my answer. Uh, well, a couple of things. Reach, uh, quick, easy reach to lots of people who might be interested. And the proselytization factor is like, what is LARP thing, this thing you're talking about now and late at the party? Let me show you the College of Wizardry trailer. And they're hooked because they know the aesthetic and they can realize what people are doing and they see what you're doing instantly through an aesthetic that they don't love, so they grok LARP instantly. That is very nice to have, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like a follow up on that question. So, but I mean, if we don't talk about like the benefits of maybe getting more people into it, would you say that there's some design qualities or, or things that make the actual experience better? Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned time. Uh, don't spend the time on building a world. That's you can spend that on other things. Of course. Okay, I realized that I actually worked with a big IP, and that was the Monitor Celestra that was based on Pasta Galeca, I just forgot. And the problem with using... The, the problem with using an, an existing IP is that everybody wants to be a Viper pilot, and that can be a problem when you don't have actual Vipers in your LARP. So, I would say like the downside of using extremely well-known IPs is that people have super extreme explicit expectations of what they're going to get from that LARP and you cannot always give them that. And when you say, but hey, we have this meta method and they go like... <laughs> so, so that is maybe the downside, like everybody wants to be Han Solo and everybody wants to, to be a Viper pilot and we cannot give them exactly that. Mm. You were about to throw the temperature of evil, please develop. Yeah. Okay, but now you asked about advantages, so I'll add a slight bit of nuance. I mean, the, the question isn't just the time that the designers use. The hard, limit, the hard limit of LARP design is how much information you can cram into the player's brain. And for a single LARP, that is very limited. Now, if you're refer referencing an already popular IP, you can use advantage that somebody else has already crammed your player's brains full of knowledge. And then they can use this in the LARP. This is also one of the many reasons why it is evil. <laughs> because the alternative to just latching onto an established IP is to sharpen your design skills, to work more on those big documents so they become shorter and shorter and shorter and get the most essential information that then unfolds into the great LARP. And it, this is hard work, but as a community, as design professionals, we need to do more of that hard work uh, to make progress as LARPers. I'm going to come in and say that uh, when we create these worlds, we're, we cannot uh, create exact copies of the worlds we're creating, uh, even though fans seem to expect that. Uh, so for me, that is the challenge, exactly what you just described, is the actual advantage. You have to adapt the world, you have to look at what is being shown, the Viper pilots for example, and then you have to look at, well okay, what meta techniques can we create? to give uh, an adequate or similar experience. And that, to me, is an incredible design challenge and a really uh, fruitful one, actually. You talked a little bit about uh, that we will have more time to develop or write the things that are really important if, if we use an already known world. Um, but do you think that we do actually use that time wisely? Do we use it to add something new or something challenging? Uh, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> no, the, um, yeah, I think it can be used in worlds that are suitable for it. I mean, there's, you can do the other thing, but yeah, no, I don't spend that much. You don't spend extreme amounts of time researching the IP. Rather, I would say, it's like having had somebody already written a lot of theory about the game, and you can go and look at it. It's a bit like rewriting a game. At least if you have things like Monitor Celeste, where we got all the books on like the philosophy of that Star Galactic, and they're like, oh, hey, here's a ton of good thematic ideas, but people have done analysis of these works already. So that gave us, certainly gave us a leg up in saying, like, okay, what are the big themes going to be, and so on. 
Then there are terrible, terrible drawbacks that I can talk to you about also. Thank you. Also that you kind of limit the, the players, um, they might want to be true to the, the IP. Uh, many years ago I made a LARP about Jesus. Uh, and last <laughs> summer, and it was it was kind of fun and weird, but also that people had so much respect for the story, so that they didn't dare to play with it, and that is also I think uh, one of the drawbacks with with using a known IP or or a fantasy world. Like, how much can we alter it, and if we alter it, is it still that world somehow? Yeah, how much can you alter it? Yeah, I, I just thought about like about Hamlet, which I think is a good, that's, that's a different thing. I think it, none of the things that said here almost apply to Hamlet, because they that's and, but I think they do apply to the Jesus game, yeah. like specifically. These are classics that are embedded into everybody's psyche in the small part of the Western world that know about these stories much. So so we have them and we relate to them and we think something about them. And then you can play off that when you build characters. But that's only like on the yeah, Hamlet level or Jesus level or Star Wars level maybe. That are these extreme myths that you can use. Uh, and then it becomes more like basing it on an existing religion or something like that. Uh, it becomes myth work more. Mia, how free did you feel when working with uh, Coven? Like, where, where would you not go? Were there a certain limit where you felt like if we do this then we are passing? out of where we should be. Uh, do you mean then in like almost like a copyright feeling or that we were doing a complete parody of it? No, I, I was thinking but that must have been something that you thought a lot about, like how much can I change? How much can I make this my own story? Is... Uh, yes, um, I kind of didn't feel because I was young and naive. Uh, <laughs> this is like last year. Um, <laughs> I didn't really feel that I had a responsibility to uh, the players in that way. Oh, uh, mainly, I guess, because I didn't feel there was a fan base for American Horror Story that wasn't that extreme. So um, I didn't have people basically screaming, it's finally happening, I can't wait, I've already sewn my clothes. Uh, I kind of just had people going like, wow, I saw the show and that's pretty cool. And I was always saying that I'm adapting, I'm inspired by. So um, I actually felt that I could go pretty far, and in some cases I did. I removed ele elements completely, I rewrote back history that didn't fit a LARP environment. Um, and I didn't care at all. <laughs> did that piss people off? Uh, not to my face. Uh, no, actually, that was not. <laughs> that was not part of any feedback that we got uh, as such. Uh, we did remove one power, because it's uh, uh, about powers, and uh, it was fire. And we did get some disappointed faces, but it wasn't, you know, again, my whole life is ruined. It was more just kind of, I really wanted to set things on fire. Uh, <laughs> so I was kind of happy that that went, to be honest. Uh, I'm gonna just, uh, Eric, from a player's perspective, what would you think is the highest risk with, uh, with IPs or placing a LARP? From a player's perspective, well, I think we just touched on it. It is that kind of, uh, if, if we're talking about literature, uh, for example, literature is, is a pretty good example here. Everybody who reads a book makes up their own interpretation of it. You know, every time there's a cinema adaptation, there's always some group of fans who like, that character doesn't look like this, and oh, they totally misunderstood the tone, and so on. And uh, as a player, you know, you can latch on to, ooh, there's a LARP, it's something that I really appreciate. And then you can come there and discover that everybody else's take on it is entirely different than yourself, than your own. On the other hand, I think hacking known IPs is, is like, less evil. <laughs> And how would you define hacking them? Like, how far do you have to go for that? You know, to put pass in your eyes. You would need to make them say something that their creators didn't intend them to say. Preferably something that is opposite to what the creators intended to say. <laughs> like uh, how the situationist revolutionaries in the 60s used Mickey Mouse as kind of a symbol both of evil capitalism and the resistance to evil capitalism. Uh, that kind of thing. <laughs> Sometimes. The reality come and hack your your known world. Like I did this game about a future 
fundamental religious USA based on the book The Handmaid's Tale that also comes to like a TV show in April. And then I invented a, in the backstory and invented a, an American president that kind of took the, the country in a total fundamentalistic and evil direction. And now I have to rewrite write the game with a real president. So the, <laughs> the, 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 the reality comes in and hacks the IP, and that's kind of interesting and scary. <laughs> I'm going to take a chance and be really shallow here, because uh, I would say the first thing that pops up in my mind when I think of difficulties is, of course, like, how do we do with the hotness? Like, if we would like to place a LARP, say, in Twin Peaks, like, that is a universe of really, really attractive people. <laughs> Not in a stick way. For example, or like the thing that you have really nice looking dragons in Game of Thrones, where people are super witty and smart and they know exactly what to say in West Wing. So if we make a political world, world we need to have people that are super sharp and fast and good in English or whatever. How do you, um, you know, work with that? <laughs> um, the best solution. It's a specific to hotness we're talking about. No. You know, you can go for that if you want to. No, yeah. um, you, it's really hard. There's a reason why Star Wars LARP is pretty hard. I mean, blasters are really fucking hard to get right. And so every, every world is differently suitable for LARP adaptation. You need to move a specific distance. Um, so. I would think that, I don't think that somebody with that is within a Twin Peaks LARP would care about, would care about that much, like two hours in. I think they completely would forget that because they have the signals and they know who is what. So they ascribe that like, attitude of hotness to whomever is playing that character. If it's like, yeah, if it works, it works. But I think you will see more of like, oh, you're ordering. It's like, of course they're going to play you up. And I think it's a shorthand to like who has those social advantages because we know the cast. Um, that's one, one way of doing it. But yes, different are differently suitable. It's really hard to replicate the more extreme IPs. And that's why maybe like, train spotting is a great IP for a lot. Maybe, and then that's like really you should say that Star Wars is not such a great IP for LARP. Coven is because it has fairly low, it's set like in the version of our real world where there is magic and there's like schools of magic. Oh, wait, have I heard it somewhere? Somewhere else. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's easy doing a adaptation of a ripoff of World of Darkness uh, mage show <laughs> because the, it is set in our world with magic and so on, which is the advantage of, of World of Darkness, of course, which is it, it is very good for that. It's made, basically made to be played like that, and some are not. So it's uh, all is different. You have to, I think you have to surgically choose an IP that you feel this would be awesome. Lord, for me this year it's uh, would be called three percent the Brazilian uh, like Hunger Games version show. That is like most larpable new IP of 2016. Uh, check it out. I all I, I start to think about it like that with with the TV and so like. Could you do a lot with this? How well could you do it? Mm -hmm. and so, it's, so yeah, I think choosing the, the, the IP is the important part. Yeah. I think uh, um, in some sense this problem is not specific to LARP space and IP. Uh, we are always uh, role-playing against our ability to look like and act like our characters. It, it applies to age. We very often play uh, characters that are not our age. Uh, it applies to size, rank, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and, but I think we also need to distinguish between promotion, promoting a LARP, the kind of stuff that works in promoting it and actually playing it. I mean, uh, College of Wizardry was not the first Harry Potter LARP. There have been thousands of Harry Potter LARPs. I was actually Dumbledore in 2000. Uh, <laughs> and I had read books. It's a point that's for fans. And, and this means that there are a lot of people who have had great Harry Potter experiences at LARPs. But you couldn't take photos and videos of that and put them online. Uh, so a lot of the kind of the visual standards uh, are very obvious when you're talking about promotion and documentation. But it's not so obvious to me that we're not able to role play around them when we're actually in play and are using our imaginations. That got me thinking of like maybe you know playing in um, intellectual property or that universe that we know, maybe that actually touches some sort of core as where we began as children. Because when you say you played Dumbledore in 2002, I think about like when I was a child and which characters from like fairy tales I wanted to play 
and that I actually got to play the, the Wicked Witch of Narnia at some at some point. I would actually like to know, like, can we do it? Have you, have you been costed like that? Uh, no, but I, I realized that the first uh, I learned when I, when I played when I was a little kid was Romeo Ravanotte. And I would love to learn in that world. But we don't know much about it. We know that it's uh, like robbers, gangs in the forest and there is a lot of magical creatures. But we don't know anything else about that world. But that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I didn't do much traditional child's play uh, and I was forbidden to have war toys or car toys uh, by my upbringing. Very nice. But I made up a lot of stories about my mon chi chi uh, dolls and had actually had, had friends over and we had, it was, we wrote down actually things that had happened the last time because we were the only good play sometimes. So mon chi chi was my franchise, so I started the franchise. <laughs> Well, in this case, that's exactly how um, I got on to actually doing the coven, uh, because I was watching it, and one of the first things I thought was, like, the expanse, uh, no, sorry, not the expanse, 3%, wow, this could really be a lot, uh, and uh, two, I was like, wow, I really want to be a witch, um, this witch that I'm seeing right here. Um, when I was younger, gosh, I wanted to be Robin Hood, so I guess that can still happen, that's still a thing. Yeah. Um, sticking to the theme of evil, I'm not sure indulging in our nostalgia and wish fulfillment tendency is all, always healthy. Uh, I mean, I, unfortunately, I, I, I didn't have a crush on the Dover Dover Doctor. In, in that case, mm -hmm. like, my approach might have been different. I wanted to be Luke Skywalker. Yeah. You know? And uh, the more I indulge in that fanboy aspect, the more likely I am to pro promote all the toys and amusement park rides and all the other Hollywood bullshit that comes along with the IP. Yeah, can you resist that? You know, the, the obvious commercial aspect of it and promotion? Does it mean I have to throw away my Star Wars t shirts? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Like, what happens? I'm, I'm thinking about what happens when our alarms that are replayed become their own IPs and we start making, like, it's just a little love in an IP that someone owns. Uh, what happens when we start doing, I don't know, just a little bit of merchandise. Uh, no, but it's, it's interesting. Wow. I love my Star Wars t-shirts and maybe they are evil, but they are fucking mine. Uh, and it's, and there is also a very big part of my upbringing and who I am as a person. So I'm, I'm there with the evil, but I'm also, it's, it's an integrated part of myself. That was an answered question. Can I just ask you, uh, would it be less evil if we made like an adaptation of an original LARP from Anna Koy that just, you know, is in her world? Only if you ask first. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, some of you might have read my paper in the Knutepunkt book, or paper rant in the Knutepunkt book. Uh, and after I read it on print, I was like, oh, I had overlooked this good thing. Because one thing is basing your LARP on very famous IPs. And then there's a whole, a whole set of questions that come with that. Some of them political, some of them moral, some of them practical. Uh, but then if our threat is like these huge mega IPs that come mostly out of the US and Britain, then in that sense, then promoting kind of the small, the narrow, the local is a counterweight to that. So if, if you're doing LARPs that are based on kind of, okay, this interesting Swedish artist, Arkali Linden, you probably haven't uh, heard about, uh, but this is really awesome stuff. Here, come and enjoy it. You know? Now that on the moral scale, I, I can't find good arguments to call it evil. I want to keep my answer simple, but I can't. We'll just call it Ralph. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have a hard time finding arguments to, uh, to like exclusively state that Star Wars is evil or that. And like, yeah, I think it's a, it's a stretch to say that everybody in the room thinks that buying awesome toys from an IP you love is evil. Uh, I don't really think so. And they are shared things that are shared globally by people and enabled by, by really passionate storytellers who sometimes come from the families and then want to touch that thing, change it, make it more suitable for here and now or what you would like to tell your friends. Like the Star Wars story that was never told. 
Um, I've always wanted to say like a, a harder and tougher uh, take on it with like blood and death and so on. And yes, eventually somebody who thought a little bit like me ended up doing Rogue One. And that's nice. So it's a conversation, it's a cultural conversation that is owned by companies that's brought and sold. Sure, that's that's the nature of how capitalism works now. But shared that are shared globally, I can't really bring myself to saying that it's evil, and I think a few of you do love a couple of those. And I don't want you to go home and feel really bad in the evening about loving those things. Because yes, they are shared, and that's I think is the last good thing about LARPing in known universes, is of course networked games. You can share worlds, and it's very easy to do so, because everybody <laughs> knows it. It's like, oh, here's another common game, or wait, here's like Berlin by night, and here is New York by night, and maybe I can go between them, and so on. So that's, I mean, that networking aspect of, of knowledge of it, and everybody sharing that love for Star Wars or whatever it is. But I think that those movies and role-playing games and everything, they already exist, so of course it, you are totally free to do LARPs in them, but what happens with the, I'm, I'm with the team evil here in, in some ways, like what happened with our own voice, what happened with our own art when we stop creating new worlds or, or new uh, realities and just hang back because there are so many good ones already made. I'm, I don't want to do LARP like that. I can do some LARPs in an IP, and I, but I, mostly I want to do my own and try to find the story that we have somehow, because otherwise we, we could we can go to a movie, we can we can do all that already. I just want to introduce and say that we are also not going to go into the discussion of all big corpse. We are going to have another panel for that on Saturday at twelve. You're really welcome to listen to that then. Um, yeah, uh, I kind of think that this, uh, I agree with Martin a little bit there, that adapting uh, already existing worlds, no matter where they come from, especially now that we are so global as we are, I kind of feel like, isn't that the tradition of storytelling? Wasn't, wasn't that what we were always doing? Like, we were orally telling stories, and then people were telling them again and adapting them, and now our stories are coming from, from media. Uh, I don't really think okay, that it's a problem. Um, well, obviously there can be problems, but... I'll try to limit the big corporate discussion, uh, but I, th I think the big difference between traditional storytelling and what is happening with our media landscape today is that with traditional storytelling, people keep on changing the stories, sometimes to mean very different things depending on the needs of society at the moment. And there is this spontaneous narrative, spontaneous way we humans do that kind of stuff. So, uh, I mean, just look at all the versions of European fairy tales throughout the centuries. Yeah, look at all the slash yeah. fiction on Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, yeah, and I mean the, the, my, my problem with big IPs is the same as Martin's advantage, uh, which is that they're standardized. They don't evolve. They are formulaic. And so to the degree that this is true, and it's not equally true of everything, uh, then I think we have a problem as a society, because fiction is where we think. But like, how, how much, let's say we, we talk about uh, a universe and we create ourselves. We do that. Um, I mean, you of course get inspiration. And that is a little bit what you already talked about. We have so many narratives and so much uh, inspiration already. So, what is really the big difference? Don't they really mash together by now? I think I just want to go back to, we discussed briefly, we are into Big Corps again, but who owns, if we talk about IP, that stands for intellectual property, somebody owns that, you cannot do stuff with, you cannot talk, you cannot do what you want with it, but if I create a world, I can do whatever I want, and then I can adapt what I'm wanting to tell with the game by creating the world in that way, and that is... I don't want my art to be owned by someone else. Uh, but how about when you use, uh, use that for a political <coughs> reason, to make a twist? Like we did in a maybe a really childish way, but just, well, we were kids. So we did Robin Hood and we said, oh, geez, like the problem with Robin Hood is, is like, where are the women? Like we don't get to hang around in the forest and have fun. So we want to do that and we want to make them less spins and it's going to be great. So, by using that, we also felt like we made a huge political point of it, and... Is it satire, then, 
Yeah, I think it was a very subtle lawyer. Yeah. So I mean, I think can't you use it like in that for other reasons to to hack it to make it political or satire or whatever? And would that in that case make it in a diminished in any way? As as Eric said, I think every time has their adaptation of stories. The story of uh, yeah, Hamlet is not the same as the last time we played Hamlet. Now I think. Hamlet or Claudius is going to be more orange than it was last time. <laughs> and so, and I think it's the same thing with IPs. I mean, the like World of Darkness says something different today than it did in '91. It's like it is a different time. We have to retell the story through that vehicle. It's the same thing with Star Wars. It means another thing today. It's like that. The, therefore, those sequels or prequels and so on can be about things today, and that's. There's, you don't need to break an IP to tell meaningful and relevant stories in it. You just need to use it as a megaphone to get that story out there. And I think that, to me, is like that's the big thing. Having others that love the thing, you can, uh, you, you can meet them, you can talk to them, you can use that fiction to tell your political story. And they will listen more if there's stormtroopers in it than if it's uh, by kitchen sink realism people. Maybe, possibly. It will, it will reach a different audience. You will tell your political story to another group. Um, I think that's, that, that, that's the biggest strength. I would just say, just it's totally okay to do LARPs in known IPs, uh, but don't lose yourself to it. Don't, don't use it as default. It's just do both. Um, I'd like to go back to see like which kind of stories or narratives or IPs does work well for LARP or which doesn't. So what would you say on that? Which are the good ones or the bad ones? Do you mean like literal names for them or do you mean what the core essence is that you can get? Yeah, no, I mean, like, how do you decide? Like, okay, I would really like to make a LARP in, uh, no, just, in, in Barba Papa, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry for having that no popping up in my, in my head. <laughs> but, but, no, but what I mean is, like, how do you decide whether this IP is probably a good idea for LARP or not? I think I would think, if the, if the world is big, I can place my LARP where, whenever, wherever in it. Like, if we're gonna do an expand, the Expanse LARP, which is built on a role-playing world, which I think is very, very clear when you watch the show, mm -hmm. uh, you could place it on Mars, you could place it on Earth, you can place it in the belt, you can place it on a, on a spaceship. That makes it very adaptable for LARP, because you can choose, okay, I want to tell, I want to, I want to make a LARP about discrimination. Okay, then we're gonna be in the belt uh, with the belters. So the, the bigger the world, you can choose more, um, fine-tune what you want to tell. It helps if the characters are human, maybe. Uh, there's, I mean, there's, there's a long, long list. There's like a ton of or checklist. And the best three. Oh, best three. Holy shit. Yeah, the, I would say easy to do, easy to prop, and the top it, then the top position goes to like Coven or World of Darkness or that thing. It's like it's our world, what shit is going on? If you want the fantasy part, that's number one. And uh, number two would be like re uh, reproducible key types of scenes that like, you, they can actually have these scenes in a lot and they would be awesome. It's like Battlestar Galactica's gun facing off, like, no, you back down from that, you don't push that button. That's those kinds of confrontational scenes work really well in LARP, and they're kind of a core driver in a lot of Battlestar Galactica episodes. Thus, awesome. And, okay, three. Then I would say, like, the, I, I, I would say spread or size if you're a megalomaniac that wants to make networked campaigns, like certain universes have. And for that one, yeah, World of Darkness seemed to work pretty well from having chronicles in different cities, the political structures build their own city, therefore every group of players can have one, and you network them, and you can, you could even do a, build a community portal that links up all your products in World of Darkness. And maybe we'll start doing that with LARP, because that is actually a thing. Uh, so yeah, I think those are some of the things, and the some shameless promotion. <laughs> Uh, one of the main ones, when I was watching, for example, Coven, but also 
when I'm trying to draw from already uh, existing IPs when I'm getting inspired is, um, it's going to sound really weird now, but basically if you can strip it all down, if you can black box it, is what I actually think. It's like, do we, does the LARP not work without lasers? Is the laser so integral to the characters, to the plot, to the, to the whole action, that without it, it would just be people running around going pew, pew, pew. And it's not worth it anymore. <laughs> then it's not working. Then you know, I think we've touched on it before. Then you, what you wanted to do was a movie or something similar. Um, this is very personal to me, but it's it's the actual human relations and everything else that I'm looking at has to be additional. In the case of Coven, human relations with magic. That's like oh, you're already messed up, and then there's magic. How does that affect what is happening? That you can black box, you don't need more. Everything else is an extra, everything else is a flavor. And then you're not as afraid as well to draw it back to its core. Um, would you say that this is a trend that we are seeing right now? And is um, the LARPs set in known universes uh, taking space? from original stories, original universes, right now? Uh, can you guess what I would answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, and it's been, it's been kind of obvious for the last few years. Uh, I mean, in, in the Nordic movement, uh, in the Knutepunkt crowd, so to speak, uh, there has been a long tradition of strong, independent, original works, uh, one we are rather proud of. Uh, and every once in a while there has been an adaptation, and as long as it's every once in a while, then there, there is nothing but good about that. Okay, so we learn interesting <coughs> things from seeing adapting established works as LARPs. But we have a finite, finite attention span. Players have finite resources. We can always record more players, but in order to, take, and to carry on uh, an interesting cultural conversation, uh, there is a limit also in that aspect. So during the last couple of years, I feel that like, things have changed dramatically. Uh, in terms of, uh, of um, using established universes and IPs has become a lot more common. And part of the reason I'm here arguing so strongly for it being evil is not because I, I want to end all IPs and you can take my Star Wars Lego and pry it my dope or cold dead hands. You know? <laughs> uh, but, but I really think that as a community, as a, as a particular movement in this world who has a chance at saying something very different than what everybody else is, we really need to keep focus our attention on the production of original works and value those. Yeah, I, I can speak against myself now and say yes. Um, <laughs> there's there, we have a really good tradition because when you make a world for exactly what you want to do, I'm going to take one example: the <laughs> Swedish fantasy world called Granland. They wanted to create the medieval mind being watched by God and like a mythological world where God is real and watching you. So they sat down and thought, like, okay, how can we trigger this in a believable way during a game? And they came up with the genius of making God a bird. Because in the forest you will encounter a bird at times and then you have the eyes of God on you. That is LARP specific setting design. And if somebody comes up with something like that, that they need to do their own thing. Um, so yeah, that's yeah, that, that, that's the other side. I'd like to to make a completely different question and saying if we would um, take a gender perspective on this, on, on the fact that we are creating more LARPs in already existing IPs, um, what would you <coughs> take? Like, do can we draw some conclusions from this? Just, I don't know if you thought about it, but I just did. Yeah, like. <laughs> 99% of all the big IPs is 99% about men. Like, we can love Rogue One, but isn't that gal like an island in a sea of men? Uh, I would say that if you're gonna do it, you need to do that. You need to choose your IPs carefully, and if they are specifically male focused as the most of them are you need to tweak them you need to change them so everybody can play in them it's it's no example it's otherwise you are in deep trouble i would say uh, 
Uh, I'd just like to bring it back quickly to the previous question as well. I actually do also think that um, it's a really good tool, especially for someone starting out, to actually take an existing world, try to adapt it into a LARP, and then actually learn how do we create. Now, the people who created Grana, I don't know their history, they may never have done anything from original IP, but I can imagine that they have seen things and worked <coughs> on them, and then they have gotten to this point. Um, I, so I don't think that I would slap someone on the fingers for suggesting it, particularly somebody who's quite new to designing. I think that's a fantastic tool. I also kind of think it's a little bit of a face. I don't think we need to be afraid of it. I don't think that creativity is going to die out. Um, people are going to get a little bored themselves, the designer, if they're just constantly adapting. And eventually we'll get that designer maybe making something incredible because they have learned so many skills from looking at the flaws and the, the other universes and they've created their own. I think that's amazing. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I mean, every IP is also different. The, the Star Wars IP is very much a sausage fest, absolutely. Um, but then along comes sometimes IPs that do the opposite thing. Coven is one good example. And through some random chance, even though only dudes wrote it, Vampire did bring in tons of women into LARPing. That was one of the big like, floodgates for that. Maybe perhaps, you know, once you've been dead for a couple of hundred years, it doesn't really matter that much. And there you can, yeah, it's a thing. And they all have equal strength. There is like, the myth is in, like, intrinsically gender equal. And it's kind of a it's fantasy that seems to appeal to women a lot. I mean, the vampire fantasy is. It has been from Dracula and so on, have an avid readership of women. Uh, so that's the flip side. It's like you can flip it and say, no more of this fantasy bullshit. It's like, no, I'm going to choose like, the Bronte sisters or whomever to, to adapt and to make it that choice. And then you, you do the gender choice from the beginning and you use it to reverse those ingrained uh, trends. I, I might go back to the big core that I'm not going to talk about, but I just had to. Like, I don't know, because I haven't counted on this, but are there like any, um, like in, in LARP pro producers, are there any male or female, uh, what do you call this in, in English, like, um, majority, majority to, towards like men <coughs> setting LARPs in already known existence or something? No, that's just speculations, but I just thought about it, or could it be because there is where the money is? Are the famous? Yeah. Speculative question. You can take that with you and maybe someone can, can comment on that. That would be interesting to know, I think. Um, we have to wrap this up. We have like one minute and I promise to be on time. It will be very... Yes, one minute we have. Uh, I'd like to, to wrap this up by uh, asking you... Actually, well, let's, let's uh, finish off on a positive <laughs> note. <laughs> to give your best advice to either if, you know, if someone here is interested in making uh, a LARP in IP, what would be your best advice? Or, you know, if you would rather give advice to other creating your own, where you start when you create your own universe? Who wants to start? I'll, I'll choose the latter. Uh, I, I think if you're going to make a LARP, it's a lot, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of blood, sweat and tears. It needs to be about something you care about, um, and the worst possible timing. No, it's not that. Not that. Yeah, no, it's the. Uh, you need to make something you care about, and you need to make something you don't understand it. And then creating the LARP is understanding it, and you won't understand it fully until long after it's over. Um, I think. You need to fall in love with material, absolutely. But actually, my advice from my great long history of experience uh, <laughs> is that don't love it too much, either. I know that sounds really weird, but if all you want to do is be in it, then that's actually not going to help you in the creation <laughs> process. Be amazed by it, be inspired by it, want to do things with it, but don't, you know, uh, get too caught up in the material, either. Yeah, maybe choose a book or IP you hate. Mm. Make it better. Yeah. Or at least don't write the Luke Skywalker character for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, ask the people who made the IP. Uh, talk to them. Say that you're doing it. They might think it's awesome. They might back you up. They might do fun things. They might do not so fun things. <laughs> uh, but it's surprising. I mean, some, sometimes you can reach out to one of the writers and so on and say, like, oh, I have this old idea in the shoebox and you can use that for a lot. It, these things actually happen. The distance between the creators of these big things and you is not as big as you think. Uh, I think I have more uh, general uh, advice. It's know, know your choices, make conscious choices in your design and everything will work out. But know your story, know what you want to explore and, and if that exploration happens to be inside a known IP, please go ahead. But please think about not, it would be awesome with Star Wars. Like, I think you should go deeper with that. Okay, we're going to explore uh, class and uh, good and evil. Then Star Wars might be a good way where to start. But in whatever you do, even if you create your own world, have this, okay, this is the question. This is what I want the, the LARP to be, to be debating somehow or struggling with. Then you're, you're on a good way. Thank you so much. That will conclude our panel. Thank you for listening. Good night.